Good morning. It is Saturday, May 16th. We are here in the sanctuary of Saxonburg Memorial. I'm with Doug Squarantino. I thought that I would invite Doug because I didn't want you guys to get confused with having to remember another name. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug for a second. He's part of the session. Um, he's just going to fill you, on, uh, fill you in on some of the things that we've decided. So, okay. And then he's going to turn it back over to me and I will fill you in on other things. So, yeah. Doug. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate that. Yeah, so we're getting excited here at Saxonboro Memorial. We're uh, looking to return this to um, uh, worshiping together. And the session, uh, we, we grouped together today. We had a nice session meeting here at the sanctuary. Uh, we did a walkthrough. Uh, we uh, talked about making plans about uh, how to enter and ent uh, exit the building, uh, seating arrangements. Uh, we also talked about uh, cleaning too, right, Doug? We talked about how we're going to clean uh, before and after the service, uh, service times, and so forth. So uh, there'll be more coming out about that. Um, I think we're off to a great start. And I know that we touched on a few items that I think Doug has on a list. Doug, did you want to go ahead and share those with us? I will. I just want you to know that uh, our insurance company recommended some things. Um, you know, wear masks. Masks will be provided when we gather for corporate worship again. Gloves also. Um, also, we're going to come in certain doors and leave certain doors. The doors will be open for you to come in so that nobody needs to touch those. Um, again, there will be signage all over of uh, where to sit. We will be cordoning off um, certain pews, and we would ask that the first people in go to the furthest seat, which would be up here in the front of the sanctuary, and then they will be the last people to leave so that you're not passing anybody as you come in. So you, I guess you're going to have to time your what time you get the worship service. So again, um, we're looking forward. We are we have a projection date of uh, June seventh, Sunday, June seventh, but that is subject to change, obviously. Um, so whatever happens, we're going to keep you fluid as possible as we can. So yeah, we'll be following the government guidelines and uh, making decisions as we go. Uh, and uh, of course, the the most important thing that we'll be uh, concerned with is the safety of our of our uh, congregation. So um, we'll be, uh, the session is going to meet again uh, prior to us opening, and we are going to uh, go through and make sure that we've got everything in order, um, especially the signs that I think Doug mentioned, um, you know, being able to uh, help you uh, 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 move through the church properly and, and uh, uh, stay safe while you're here. And uh, the session, and uh, I believe the deacons are also going to help out and we're going to be here to uh, assist you in, in, in any way that we can uh, to make it a, um, a very uh, enjoyable experience. Uh, I know these are uh, crazy times right now with everything that's going on. And, and we're going to make sure that it uh, is still a great, great uh, experience for you to come to Saxonburg Memorial and worship with us. Right, Doug? Absolutely. I, I also just want to say that um, we are going to block off uh, the lower level, the fellowship hall. Um, so I would ask that if you are able to park in the lower parking lot and walk up the hill, please do that. Um, let's leave the upper parking to the elderly and those that uh, have mobility issues so that they can just park either on the street or in the parking lot and come right into the building. So. That's all we have for now. Again, as Doug said, we will have another meeting prior to us opening, and then we will have a meeting directly after, hopefully um, the week after the 7th, um, is our first scheduled session meeting, and we can talk about more and evaluate how our first Sunday went, hopefully. So again, have a great Saturday. Have a great Sunday. I guess you're going to be seeing this, so have a great Sunday. I am glad you're worshiping with us today. Have a great week. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Once again, I want to welcome you back to uh, Saxonburg Memorial Presbyterian Church. I am glad that you are worshiping with us. I'm going to go into the pastoral prayer, so I would ask that you uh, bow your heads and, uh, and let's pray together. Let's pray. Our gracious and almighty God, we, we are glad that you lift us up into your presence and we are glad that you let us feel near as we come together to worship once again and to turn to your word. 
Lord, I pray that you would calm our our fears, open our minds, and ready us to receive what you have to give us on this, the Sabbath day. Whether it's in sermon or through song or in silence, Lord, what we seek is your courage and your hope and your love. We need them in the world that is so filled with trouble. Lord, capture our hearts with your grace and drive out the fear that makes us compromise our values and draw back from your challenges. Give us such confidence in your abiding care for us that we are able to live boldly and serve freely as you call us, each one of us, to serve. We thank you this day for the many answered to answers to prayer that we have already received and for the gift of a long life with which you have blessed so many in our congregation. We thank you for the chance to celebrate with others as they reach goals of graduation and as new adventures begin. We thank you for the faithfulness of family and friends and for the support of others in times of trials. We thank you, Lord, for those who extend themselves to help others, who offer friendship and speak words of encouragement and wisdom. Lord, now that we we pray for those who are mentioned in this service. We pray for Regina and her continued eye, continued um, recovery from her eye surgery. Lord, we pray for Marilyn as she continues to recover from her knee surgery. We give you thanks for a successful surgery, and we give you thanks that she is home already. Lord, we just pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chain are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigned, unending love, amazing. Today we're going to talk about dirt. We've not talked about dirt yet, so I wanted to come back here and show you what we've got going on. We've got uh, our hired help here in the back, my children and the neighbors. David plants the gardens and uh, he enjoys doing the vegetables. I um, planted some blueberries. See my blueberries? They like acidic dirt so I had to mix in some uh, pine needles and um, peat moss to give them the kind of dirt that they like. David's tilling up the dirt back there to get it ready for the garden to get it nice and flat. 
so they can plant over here. He planted some spinach and he's got the nice little fence around it so the bunnies don't get to it. And he's got the rows all ready to go. It's keeping them out of trouble is what it's doing. And over here, I'm calling it the orchard because uh, we have some apple trees over here that are blooming beautifully. And then I recently bought some raspberry bushes too. And uh, they're doing pretty good. I thought they might, um, see? I thought they might not do well with the frost but, and the freeze, but they've done okay. You know, there's different stuff you have to do with dirt to get ready for the harvest. You have to dig it up and you have to till it, turn it over and have the ground all ready to go like that so it's nice and rich and ready to receive the seeds. Did you know that uh, Jesus talked about that too? He talked about rototilling and putting orange fence around your garden, bringing the neighbors over to help. Nah, he didn't talk about that. But he talked about the soil. And when he was talking about soil, he was kind of talking about our souls and our heart. You know, in Matthew, Matthew 13, there's a parable about soil and about dirt. And it just talks about um, talks about what we have to do when we receive information. You know, like what kind of a person are you whenever you hear the Word of God? Are you ready to receive it? Are you listening carefully? Or are you kind of bitter and hard and not wanting to hear the good news that God's giving us? So I would like you to look up Matthew 13 and the parable of the sower. And it talks about the different dirt and what happens when there's weeds and the weeds are kind of the bad stuff that's in our heart and that's what that means see when we have bad stuff in our heart it's hard for us to accept the good news the good news of the gospel about God and his love so that's our job is to do the hard stuff do the do the gardening if you have to dig up the weeds till it up if you have to put some fertilizer on for my raspberries, I put on some wood chips to keep them nice and moist. See the wood chips? And when I, the person I bought them from said they need manure too. We'll see about that. I think they might sell that in a different way that might be more appropriate for me. But uh, anyway, it's good to be ready for the Word of God. And that's one of the reasons why we go to church is to... Um, be ready to accept what God has to tell us through other people and through fellowship. So today I hope that your heart is ready to hear God's word. I hope that if you have some hard hardness or some weeds in your life that you need to pluck out, that you take care of that so that you can be ready for what God has to offer you. So I hope you're doing well. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. And I hope you enjoyed the tour of our backyard. And we'll have to keep you posted on uh, the vegetables that are growing and where those boys, what they're doing. I always have to keep a close eye on them. They're, be they're handy, though, these days. They can be handy. <laughs> hey, I love you. I miss you. See you soon. Bye. This morning's scripture reading comes from John chapter 14, verses 15 to 21, if you'd like to follow along with me. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The Word cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him.
Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Once again, gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Imagine, if you will, if you are one of Jesus' 12 disciples. You just heard that Jesus, your best friend, tell you that he will be leaving soon. I'm sure you'd be perplexed to say the least. How could Jesus say that he would leave when he promised to always be with you? The disciples have wondered what all this have meant all this meant and i'm sure you have too do you struggle with these words as well because many people do people wonder perhaps you are one of them why jesus had to leave life would have been so much simpler if jesus had remained on earth then we wouldn't struggle with doubts or questions right I don't think so, and you know better than that. Christ Jesus had to return to heaven so that our salvation might be complete. He did this not to complete, not to complicate things, but to comfort us. In fact, in our text this morning, we find Jesus giving us a comforting promise. Jesus promises to care for us, and he promises to be with us. Everybody likes to feel needed. Everybody likes to feel cared for and loved. But love is about being in relationship with other people. There is, of course, there are, of course, different levels of love. We often say as Christians that we love our neighbors without really knowing who they are. There's also a different kind of love that we have for our friends or for our children or even for our spouses. And even the type of love that we reserve for things like, for me, it's ice cream, bakery goods, or a nice Tuscany hard crust bread right out of the oven. The love that God shows us as humanity is a love without bounds. Our God is the God of creation who brought order out of chaos. Our God is the God of Israel who brought slaves into the promised land. Our God is the one whom when we have gone astray from his principles has sent prophets to call us back to justice. Our God is the one who is also Jesus, our teacher, our prophet, our savior, who tells us that love is not reserved for the powerful, but it is also for the least of these. In this passage from John's gospel, we find ourselves back in time before the death and resurrection. Jesus is telling the disciples that tragedy awaits him, that one of them will betray him, and that there will be soon be a time where he is not with them in the same way he is now. All of this is bad news that is set, however, in the context of reassurance. Jesus tells his disciples that they will not be abandoned by God as the events unfold. They are told that God will send a new advocate that will help the disciples and future generations of disciples to discern the will of God as new issues and problems emerge. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, will be the voice of God, of Jesus, and we will never be alone. In John chapter 14 here, Jesus is nearing the end of his public ministry. Judas has already slipped out into the night and set in motion the events that would soon lead to Jesus' betrayal and arrest, his mock trial and crucifixion. In the time remaining, it is critical for Jesus to brief his disciples 
about what was most important for them to know and to do. Jesus emphasized, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Then in the next breath, he told them that he would ask the Father, and God will give you an advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth. As Jesus obediently moved toward the cross, he had every right to expect and ask of his disciples, both then and us as disciples today, to do the same. Jesus ordered them to obey. He said, keep my commandments. And as an ongoing sign of their love for him in the world, we do that. And what were the commandments that Jesus wanted his disciples to keep? Jesus required that we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. All of his teachings fell within these two summations of the law, which Jesus combined to make one great commandment. As we read through the gospel account of Jesus' teaching and his actions, it becomes very clear that Jesus, unlike so many of our culture today, did not define love as a mushy sentiment or limit love to physical affection. Jesus made it clear that love is an action verb. The agape love that Jesus talked about described the same kind of love that Jesus had for his own, for us. Jesus exhibited a self-giving love that seeks the good of the other person. This godly brand of love, generous and by its very nature, is a sacrificial love. Throughout his ministry, the disciples had seen this love portrayed in Jesus as he reached out in compassion to others. See, he was never too busy to stop and attend to the needs of those who cried out to him for mercy or healing. He ate with sinners and gathered with the outcasts. And he touched the lives of those who were considered defiled as a way of saying to them, you matter to me. God loves you, and he calls you to be part of this family. But in a span of 24 hours, his disciples would witness the true depth of Jesus' love for them as he suffered and he died on the cross. He did so because his love was great for all of us and because he lived in obedience to the Father's will and to his understanding of the role of the Messiah as revealed in the suffering servant passages in Isaiah. For Jesus, love and obedience were tied together and he expected no less from his disciples, both now and then. Listen to what Jesus said next. Jesus spoke about asking the Father to give another, the advocate, to be with them forever. Again, this is the spirit of truth. <clears throat> Jesus would soon be leaving them, and not just once, but twice. He would leave them for, for three short days during the time of his death, which must have been three very long days for those disciples. Then 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus would leave them again and ascend and return to the heavenly realm to sit at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus was leaving his disciples, and yet he would not be leaving them alone. They would not be orphaned because God the Father and the Son would send the Holy Spirit to be with them. Jesus would be absent from their midst as God in human flesh. However, the Spirit would, be, would continue the presence of God. 
with whom to them would remain in them. It's interesting to note that Jesus described the Holy Spirit as another advocate. The same personal relationship that the disciples had with Jesus during his time would carry on with the very breath and the Spirit of God would come to them and dwell within them in the Advocate. Even though Jesus would be leaving them, at the same time he would be present with them in a more powerful way, a more intimate way through the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, the Spirit would act as the disciples' advocate, who would always be with them. An advocate in the Greek literally means someone who is called to stand by our side and help. The Holy Spirit comes to us and takes away our inadequacies and enables us to cope with life. Our comforter comes through the strength comes with strength and empowers us to act in obedience. We know from our own experiences that this is difficult to keep God's commands. On our own, we fall short of God's glory, but the Holy Spirit now comes to us, stands with us, and enables us to keep the commandments. God's continuing presence and power go on with us in life and help us to say no to temptation, to self-centeredness, and to sin. But it enables us also to say yes to God, to do God's will. We confess that it is difficult to love others in the same way that Jesus loves us. But it's not an impossible task for the Spirit who helps us, shores up our weak attempts, and provides what we lack so that we are enabled to love and serve others as we are called to do. In this way, we keep and we fulfill the commandments to, the, to God's great glory. So what does the Holy Spirit do for us? First of all, the Holy Spirit is known by many different names. He is known as the Spirit of Promise, the spirit of truth, the spirit of power, and also the intercessor. Anything of eternal value in this life and in eternity comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we want to follow Jesus and see what we need, what we need help to do, God gives us his Holy Spirit. We need simply to ask for it and be obedient to receive it. So what power does the Holy Spirit yield? The Holy Spirit yields, has the power to transform us. Jesus' disciples to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We bear witness to Jesus in this way. We absolutely cannot do this in our own strength, through our own power, but it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that is given to us. Jesus himself in the next chapter called the Holy Spirit the helper. The helper will guide us into all truth, convicting us of sin, of unrighteousness, and of judgment. We will get to see ourselves what dwells in our flesh through the spirit of the light of God's word. The Holy Spirit gives us power for victory over, over, over choosing sin and not choosing sin. It is written, if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If we live in the spirit and walk in the spirit, we won't become high-minded, provoking, and envying one another. So think of the fellowship that grows out of this work of the Spirit as the fruits of the Spirit grow in us more and more. Another task of the Holy Spirit is to be an intercessor. 
he will take what is from Jesus and declare it to us. Jesus gives diversities of gifts to his disciples through the Holy Spirit. Spirits of healing, the gifts of healing, prophecy, tongues, interpretation, the word of knowledge, the words of wisdom, working of miracles, discerning of the spirits. See, the Holy Spirit works these gifts in us for the profit of the entire body of Jesus Christ, the entire body. The Holy Spirit provides wise counsel to Christ's followers. Jesus knew he would be going away, and that his followers would need the Holy Spirit as a helper and as an advocate to remind them of his teachings. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in the lives of believers so that we will never, ever be alone. Amen and amen.
Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's hanging in there and doing well um, during this time. Um, excited to gather together again soon. Um, just wanted to share a brief reflection on John chapter 14, verses 15 to 21, in which I just read and Pastor Doug is preaching on. Um, I believe the, the sermon title is You Are Not Alone, um, and how true that is that we have the Holy Spirit um, as God's own spirit within us. Um, I think it's so easy. I get caught up in this. I'm guilty of this, just like I think we all are as human beings at times, is to forget about the Holy Spirit. Um, maybe not forget, but um, diminish the Holy Spirit within our lives, you know. Um, this is the greatest gift that God has given us, and it says right here in John 14 um, that the Holy Spirit is, call is called the Counselor, the greatest Counselor. And not just that, but the Spirit of Truth, Counselor and Spirit of Truth. And there's many other names for the Holy Spirit as well. Um, and I think sometimes we get afraid by those titles, you know, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, as if um, that's a little too charismatic for us or something. But I think the reality is, is that we diminish the work and presence, presence and work of the Holy Spirit within our lives. Um, so often I think we downgrade God's own Spirit within us because we're operating in our own humanness, operating in our flesh, and not really um, trusting in God's Spirit within us to work and do that which He started. You know, He who began a, a great work within you will carry it on to completion in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, from Philippians that He began a, a good work in us and He sent us the Holy Spirit to continue that work, you know. Um, because we can't physically see God, literally see God, I think it's so easy to just depend upon our tradition and depend upon uh, our prayers and even, you know, the Word, which is what we stand upon as our sword, you know, as truth, but we forget about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit. Um, this is the greatest gift that God has given us um, on this side of things, on earth, to to truly live the life that He wants us to live, right? Which is one that is Spirit-filled, and not just Spirit-filled, but Spirit-led, you know? Um, do we wake up in the morning and ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, and ask the Holy Spirit to show us the way today and guide us in God's truth and by the gospel of our Lord Jesus like are we doing those things I just I'm posing these questions as much for myself as for all of us you know it's it's so easy to maybe not forget but just diminish the work of the Holy Spirit and again not just his work but his presence within our lives you know um, he wants to be our greatest friend and our greatest um, comfort you know the great counselor Great Counselor, Spirit of Truth. Um, and as it says there in John 14, those are just two names that um, God gives the Holy Spirit, Counselor and Spirit of Truth, amidst others. Um, so I guess that's my brief thought and reflection today, is just the question of, um, can we see the Holy Spirit in our lives? Can we see the Holy Spirit's presence and the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives? Um, can we see that? Um, see Him working within us in our day-to-day, moment-to-moment, you know, even the mundane within our lives. Can we see the, the mark of the Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us um, throughout all our days? Um, and if not, I think we need to ask. We need to ask and we need to pray that God would send His Spirit and fill us more with His Holy Spirit. I've been doing that recently and just seeing, um, seeing some changes that I think um, starting to follow my own intuition and my own desires, hopefully my own needs and wants less and more um, just trying to follow God through His Spirit. And uh, that's a process, obviously, that takes time and surrender and dependence upon Him. But I don't want us to be afraid of the Holy Spirit and His work in and through us, His presence. Um, so I'm just going to pray for us and uh, we'll be good. God, thank you so much for sending us your spirit, as it says in John 14, that Jesus is saying, you know, I'm sending, I'm leaving here to be with the Father, with you, but I'm sending my spirit to be with you, um, the counselor, the spirit of truth, to uh, live within us and to reign within us, and not just, not just as a guide, but as, a, as your presence, your very own spirit within us. So I pray for all of us that your spirit would, would increase within each of us as individuals and as a church in Jesus name 
I ask that that would be so and that we would live and move and have our being um, according to you, according to your spirit uh, in our day-to-day, moment-to-moment lives. I ask that in Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen. Thanks, guys. Much love. Lost our sage, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy I again would like to thank those of you who are supporting the ministry and would, I would ask that you would continue to support the ministry. I want to thank you for all that you do. Um, you continue to be supportive and I thank you for that. I also just want to mention that on Thursday night we will be having a, a Zoom meeting 
for uh, a recap of the sermon and any questions that you have on this sermon. I will put out some uh, questions shortly after this sermon so that you can um, have them in your, in your midst and we can talk about them on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Richard C. Halverson was the chaplain to the United States Senate for about 15 years and he closed each session with these words. He said, you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. He has a purpose for your being there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in his grace and love and power. And all God's children said, amen and amen. Have a super week. I'm glad you worshiped with us.